All right, folks, welcome in. It's another brand new edition. It is a year-end edition. It's We're closing down 2023 and moving into 2024. There's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon. So I figured, you know, got to have a, 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 a season-ending post-mortem. You got to have it. Probably should have done a little bit earlier in the year, but I uh, had a lot going on, but that's okay. We'll 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 touch on all of that here tonight. Want to say welcome in everybody. I'm your host Lawrence Stocker. You can find me on Twitter at ldoc93. You can find the 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter at 901 Soccer Pod. You can find Bluff City Media on Twitter at Bluff City underscore Media. And you can find us over on Facebook as well. Just search 901 Soccer. We'll pop right up. Just search Bluff City Media. We'll pop right up. What we've got in store on this show for you this evening, talking end of the year, all things Memphis soccer in the year 2023. What does that mean? We're going to be talking a lot, and I don't want to see. So don't don't worry about that. We're going to touch on a little bit of other stuff, but the bulk of this show this evening is going to be 901 FC. Uh, talking 75, 80, 85% of the show is going to be 901 FC. Okay, a uh, lot to discuss. I'm going to try to go in chronological order rather than necessarily – uh, bullet points, uh, like an order of importance. Um, just my brain, I'm a linear thinker, so we got to go on a line. And uh, so that's how we're going to do it. We're going to start at the start and we're going to end at the end. It's not a Clint Eastwood movie. We're not bouncing all over the map, uh, but that's okay. Uh, and then as we get towards towards the end of it, once we get done covering everything about 901 FC that happened this year, we will talk a little bit of Memphis Americans. They've gone bye-bye. Uh, we'll talk to the University of Memphis women's team, and we will talk to the University of Memphis men's team as well. But like I said, the bulk of the show tonight is going to be Memphis 901 FC because when it comes to soccer in Memphis, the attendance may stink, but 901 FC is still what moves the needle. So we'll just jump right into it. The, uh, the, the year for 901 FC really this year got started last year, if that makes sense, when Ben Pierman left Memphis 901 FC to go take the same, to take the managerial job with the Charleston Battery. That is something that it sucked. Um, that is something that I personally probably should have seen coming way back in September, as after the game against the Charleston Battery in 2022 at AutoZone Park, it was a Friday night game. Memphis 901 FC won five to nothing. And the Charleston Battery had three players, uh, the head coach, Connor Casey, and an assistant all dismissed from the game. You give up five goals and you have five people red carded, you've got some serious organizational problems. And after the game, off the record, you know, I was like, man, like dude, dude, have you seen anything like that? And he's like, no, nah, man, like, I've never seen anything like it. All I know is they got, they got some stuff going on over there and there's, there's probably some organizational changes that are, that are coming. Um, and then lo and behold, three months later, new Memphis, new Charleston battery coach, Ben Pierman. Um, so in steps, Stephen Glass. And if, if you recall back when the 901 soccer podcast was an audio only podcast prior to the move over here to Bluff City Media, you'll recall that when Ben left, I said, look, this sucks. You should have moved hell and earth or hell, hell and high water. You should have moved heaven and earth. I, I, I get my euphemisms all mixed up. I apologize. You should have moved heaven and earth to keep him here. And failing that, now that he's gone, you better go get somebody. You better go get a name. And they landed on Stephen Glass. And when I saw the announcement, I said, I recognize that name. So that's a that's a plus. I recognize the name. It's not the local PE teacher. It's, it's a real coach. So you look it up, and I'm like, oh, Stephen Glass used to manage Atlanta United 2 in the USL. That's where I recognize the name from. And then do a little bit of digging, and he also managed Atlanta United in MLS, was an interim uh, many years ago for Shamrock Rovers in Ireland, and most recently had been the manager at Aberdeen in the Scottish Premiership. Um, so on the, on the plus side, he's got a wealth of experience. He's managed in this league, and it's a name that I recognize. So that was all, those were all good. Those those boxes all got checked. The downside is he had a losing record at three of his previous four stops. Now, here's what I'll say about that. I said it early in the season, and I'm going to reiterate it. The only one of those that I was going to hold against him and cause me concern was his stint at Aberdeen because he was the full-time guy there for, for, for more than just a few games. At Atlanta Union, at Shamrock Rovers, he was the interim boss for like eight games whatever. Okay. Um, 
Atlanta United too. Your your job, and, and it's a little bit different now, given that a lot of these MLS two teams are all MLS Next Pro. Um, but your job at Atlanta United two was not necessarily to win games; it was to develop players for the first team. So again, there, I'm not going to hold a losing record against them all that much. Not not the end of the world. Not a big deal. And then you know the stint at Atlanta United. A, it was during the COVID year, weird time for everybody. And B, he was taken over for Frank DeBoer. Frank DeBoer is uh, known, and and I, I didn't get it as much at the time as I do now, but Frank DeBoer is a first-class grifter. Uh, I'm not quite sure how this man keeps getting employed, but he keeps getting employed, uh, so more power to him for that. So those first three, yeah, they might have been losing records, but whatever, right? Aberdeen was the one where it's like, hmm, you know, maybe cause for concern. And then you move into the start of the season, and it was a rough start to the season. So you, you know, the, you at, in the moment at the time felt that those concerns were maybe justified. And as time went on, uh, I won't quite say unfounded, but uh, cons- the, the level of concern went from very high very early on to as the season went on to go, okay, it's fine. this was a good hire. Stephen Glass was a good hire. I think, in my opinion, Stephen Glass ended up being a good hire. Um, so you, you, the level of concern was perhaps a little bit unnecessarily high. I'm sure there was an element of very much prisoner of the moment. Um, Eric Hasseltine with the Memphis Grizzlies has a saying, you never get too high after a win and you never get too low after a loss. I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. So when things are going bad, it's it's the worst. And when things are going good, it's the best. And this season perfectly encapsulates uh, my personal struggle with with that line of thinking, um, because you know it was a rough start to the season. All, um, you, you're already not happy about your coach of the year from the previous year leaving. Um, so that's that was a that was a tough spot for for Stephen Glass. I'll say that that is in any sport, in any team, in any country, anywhere in the world, you never want to be the guy that follows the guy, right? Um, like Duke basketball, John Shire has done okay, but you know, taking over from Mike Shevsky, that dude's won more basketball games than any person in history, and it, you know, the expectation is only going like there's there, there's nowhere to go but down essentially, right? And whoever ends up taking over from Nick Saban at Alabama is going to be in that same position. Um, you know, David Moyes. If we want to go soccer, we go David Moyes at Manchester United. Taking over for Sir Alex Ferguson, you there was it was only going to end one way, okay. And so, in that sense, it was a tough spot for Stephen Glass to have to take over from Ben. Ben had it much easier when he took over, in the sense that expectations were not high. Okay, twenty nineteen and twenty twenty were not good years. Uh, the team stunk, and Tim Mulqueen was dismissed, and Ben took over. And I said it before, and I will say it probably every time his name comes up until the day I die that anytime something good in 2019 and 2020 happened, Tim Mulqueen was, oh, Ben saw this and Ben drew this up and Ben talked to so-and-so and and, like all the good stuff that happened in those two years was because of Ben. And then all the stuff that happened in 21 and 22, Ben was the manager. So, um, and then I don't think it's a coincidence that the Charleston battery went to the USL final this year. So Stephen Glass behind the eight ball perception wise a little bit there and the season got off to a rough start. Let's be real. Um, even before the games kicked off, you had that news story, which I think came from channel three or channel five. My gut says channel three. They're usually, uh, one of the only outlets to even acknowledge 901 FC's existence. So I'm going to say it was channel three. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And somebody be more than happy to correct me. Uh, but you had that story come out where Philip Goodrum said that he wanted to leave and 901 FC wouldn't let him leave. And, you know, I defend when that came out. I defended 901 FC. I've been very hard on this organization a lot of times throughout the years, and and I make no apologies for it. I mean, I mean what I say. Sometimes I've been wrong, but that's okay. Um, I was on 901 FC side here. Philip from from 2022 to 2023, Philip Goodrum and Aaron Malloy were two of the players they absolutely had to keep, and they kept them both, and good on them for that. And so for Goodrum to come out and complain that you know he wanted to leave and they wouldn't let him, well, dude, you had a contract. Contract exists for a reason. You abide by the contract. Um, uh, you know he and, and then we'll discuss. We'll we'll touch on more Philip Goodrum later. 
Um, but so you're already behind the eight ball with, uh, you know, losing your coach and having to replace him. You're behind the eight ball when your leading goal scorer from the previous year is very public in that he didn't want to be here. And then in the run up to the season opening game, you had the field issues, if you will recall, right? You had, they had torn up all of the grass and they were going to put down new sod. And it was like three days before the game and the grass was not down yet. Uh, for that season opening uh, game against Loudon, and I, you know, there there were a lot of people in panic mode. There were rumors flying around that the game was going to have to get moved to Mike Rose. Um, fortunately, nine one FC got it done. They got the field down. They put the, the grass, and it looked amazing. Um, that's probably the best it's ever going to look for soccer at AutoZone Park. Um. And that makes the following week's trip to Oakland so much, or two weeks, two weeks later, trip to Oakland so frustrating. Is because Oakland knew the field wasn't going to be ready, made 901 see fly all the way out there. They showed up and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, we just replaced the turf and you guys have to fly back home to Memphis and then fly back out here over the summer because we just put the turf down and uh, for some reason we forgot that uh, it wasn't ready. So that, that, you know, if I had been Craig Unger, Stephen Glass, uh, Caleb, any of those guys, I'd have been pissed. And I'm sure they were. And they had every right to be because that was a crock of shit. Um, not only have you got their field put down in two days and then played a game, Oakland had all these extra weeks and they waited until two days to put turf down. And then they said, oh, yeah, by the way, we forgot to tell you. We just put our turf down. You guys got to go home. Sorry. Um, so that was a crock. And... The you had you were winless in your first four games to start the season. You had back to back home losses to Loudon and Pittsburgh, both by three one score lines, and then you had a couple of road draws. And you know, things weren't looking good. I was down in the dumps, I was being very negative. It happens and it will happen again. Don't worry about that. Um, and then you had the the switch got flipped, and it ended poorly, but I do think a part of it, a shot in the arm, was delivered to the team and to the organization when they signed Bill Hamid. I mean, this I mean, they built it. Tim Howard flat out said it's just the biggest signing in team history. And to be perfectly honest, I, I, I agreed then, and I still think that I agree now because that was a dude with 200-something appearances in MLS, a U.S. national team goalkeeper, um, the, as luck would have it, the third U.S. national team goalkeeper to play for 901 FC after Tim Howard and Cody Cropper. And so I think the results didn't come. You had a couple of draws, Hamid's first few games in there. And then I think the switch really got flipped with the Open Cup run. Excuse me. All three games on the road in the Open Cup, so that was a little bit Excuse me. All three games in the Open Cup were on the road, so that was a little bit frustrating, especially after last year's game and the Open Cup was on the road. Um, when the reverse of that was true in 2019, when all three games were at home, granted two of them were at Mike Rose, but we still, I apologize, we still got to go. And part of me, my, like my gut says that the reason for not even attempting to host those three Open Cup games was the organization's strategy to try to gain extra leverage for getting money to build the soccer stadium. And as we all know now, that didn't work. You know, because the second richest owner in the NBA decided that he couldn't chip in any money to build his own, you know, to fix his own arena. Um so it stunk at the time that all the games were on the road, but I mean, this is not anything official. This is just what my gut tells me and where my thought process went as it was happening. And my gut still tells me this, and this is where my thought process still is. I think this was a, a conscious decision by 901 FC to have all of the Open Cup to not even attempt to bid to host any of the Open Cup games and play them all on the road as a way to gain extra leverage. And, uh, you know... I think even Craig Unger, you know, put out a couple of tweets that said, look, the time to flip from baseball to soccer and vice versa takes this number of days. The amount of time that we would have to do it to host these Open Cup games is, is, is very tight. And this is why we need a stadium. 
I'm pretty sure that was the tweet or series of tweets or X's or whatever you want to call them now. Um, so that's where my thought press and, you know, they kept winning. So it, what? It, I don't guess it was a bad strategy. It, it didn't end up working, but would I have liked to have had one of those three open cup games at home? Yeah. Um, or is there, I, I don't know. I don't want to second guess it, but I kind of want to second guess it, if that makes sense. In the sense that, I mean, it, it, they were, I feel like they were trying to do everything they possibly could to get the money for the stadium. Because, quite frankly, that needs to be, if not the priority, then a priority is to get the stadium. And if that was going to help get that done, then more then that's what needed to be done. It just stinks that they were all on the road and we got none of them at home. Because that is when... In 2019, when Orlando City came here, that is one of maybe three times ever that the larger local media, apart from myself in an individual capacity, and now in my capacity here at Bluff City Media, uh, has paid attention to 901 FC. I mean, you had two different writers from the Commercial Appeal. You had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, an addition to John Varlis, somebody else from the Daily Memphian, Channel 3, Channel 5, Channel 13, 24. They, like, everybody was there when 901 FC played Orlando City in the Open Cup. And I have to imagine it would have been much the same if they had been able to host Atlanta United here. But they went on the road to, they, you know, they started the Open Cup at Knoxville and they beat them. Then they went on the road to Atlanta United and beat them. And that was one where they were dead in the water. And Philip Goodrum got a penalty with what was essentially the last kick of regulation. And then they, Knight Pickering, put it away in extra time. And perhaps. That is why MLS wants out of the U.S. Open Cup now is because they said we can't keep losing to, you know, we can't keep losing to 901 FC. And, uh, you know, I, shout out. I, for, I forget who it was that sent me that tweet, but that was a good one. So I stole it and I hijacked it for the, for the purposes of this podcast episode. And then, of course, the Open Cup run came to an end in Birmingham where they got absolutely shelled. Um, I, I think, you know. For years, Lynn Family Stadium in Louisville was the House of Horrors for 901 FC. I think the new House of Horrors is a uh, protective stadium in Birmingham. I think we're, uh, we're, we've played three or four games there and haven't won. Um, so not a not that it's a fortress by any stretch of the imagination because nobody ever goes to the games in Birmingham. Uh, just remember, if the attendance news is good, nobody works to keep quiet. Everybody is always very quick to put out attendance information, and for whatever reason, outside of their uh, inner Miami Open Cup game before Messi signed, uh, it's very hard to find Birmingham Legion attendance numbers. And I wonder why that might be the case. Just remember, if they were good, they would want to let you know about them. So the Open Cup run, I think, sparked this team. It sparked the season. Because after the Hamid signing and then after those first one or two wins in the Open Cup, then you had a long unbeaten run. You went 12 games unbeaten. You didn't lose a game in, at all in April, May, or June. That's three months without a loss. That is wild. That is wild. I think that's that's unprecedented for this team, and that might be unpre- not quite unprecedented, but almost unprecedented in the history of the league. I mean, that was an awesome 12-game unbeaten run. You had some big ones. 12 games without a loss. Um, in the middle of all of that, you had Philip Goodrum traded to Tulsa for Rodrigo da Costa, who came in, and I think 9-1 FC won that trade. Um, that's something that you see in a lot of other sports is, well, who won the trade? Who lost the trade? Now, I don't want to see won the trade. Rodrigo de Costa was a very important piece of this team this year. But you got wins over Rio Grande Valley. You got a win over Hartford, a win at home over Colorado Springs. You beat Tulsa twice, one of them after the uh, Goodrum de Costa trade. Uh, you beat Miami like 5-1, to one, which was awesome. You went on the road to Louisville. Yours truly went on the road to Louisville as well. Uh, you beat them. And then you had Ben Pierman and Charleston come to town, and you beat them. Unfortunately, I was out of town in Baton Rouge refereeing at regionals for that one. So you're near the top of the Eastern Conference standings. You've had a 12-game unbeaten run. And if you'll recall earlier in this episode when I said, you know, I've tried the never too high after a win, never too low after a loss, I was high, man. I was high on my own supply. I was Rocky Mountain high like John Denver. It was, it was, it was a fun Fun time to be a 901 FC fan. And that led into a nationally televised ESPN game. Might have been ESPN too. At the Phoenix Rising, uh, if not on, right around 4th of July. And it was all downhill from there for the next month. Um, you had five games in the month of July. You won none of them. 
You started off, you got absolutely pounded. And not just like they beat you, but they pounded you. Six nothing. But you think, you know what? They've gone 12 games unbeaten. You knew they weren't going to go unbeaten the whole rest of the way. Phoenix is a good team. Burn the tape, move on to the next one. Okay, you move on to the next one. The reigning USL champs are coming to town for the next one. That's San Antonio. They blew your doors off. Four to nothing. Ten to nothing in back-to-back games is rough. That's not a fun place to be. So you want to talk about going from up here, high on my own supply, to down in the dumps, ready to end it all. Um, That was not a fun time. So from the end of June and into August, you went seven games without a win. They stopped the bleeding a little bit. They got draws out in Oakland, out, you know, yes, out in Oakland when that game should have been played in March. Uh, But as we we discussed, Oakland uh, didn't know when they could get their field ready. Seven games without a win. And then two of those games were very frustrating losses um, at Pittsburgh. And then whoever the last one was in July, I forget. I didn't put it in my notes because I'm an idiot. But multiple goal leads in both games and then you lost both games by multiple goals that's that was a that was a tough time that was rough i'm not gonna lie to you that 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 was not great i was not not in the best shape at that moment in time that i'm sure most of you weren't as well um and it, it uh I, uh one of those moments i uh after the pittsburgh game i, I was a guest on uh Five Sports 56 on uh, one one random morning for the morning show with Greg Gaston and Eli Savoy, and I, I made the, the wise-ass remark, because you know me, I'm, that's me, I'm a wise-ass, that uh, you know, it was like Ryan Silverfield was coaching the team. And uh, that, that statement even ended up being a little bit more prophetic than I had realized, because even this year, Ryan Silverfield, uh, for the fifth time in his coaching career at Memphis, had a double-digit lead in the game and managed to lose it. Uh, so having multiple goal leads turn into multiple goal defeats multiple times was tough. But they closed out the season. They bounced back. They closed out the season very strong, I think, with the exception of the final regular season game. They closed the season very well, in my opinion. They We talked about it all the time, but we talked about it specifically in 2021. The game against Birmingham. Dead in the water, it's the 90-plus minute, you're down 2-1, to one. F this, we're done. Two goals in stoppage time, and you win 3-2, to two. and I wasn't there for it. I stayed at home watching football, and I won't make that mistake again. So that was, you went from down here to up here in the blink of an eye, and all of a sudden you didn't, you lost like one game the rest of the season, if I'm not mistaken, maybe twice. But from September into all of September, all of October, They didn't lose again, and they made the playoffs for the first time. Had a similar situation in September this year when they hosted Tampa. It was a Wednesday night game. And Tampa's coach, I believe it's two to, it was not not only she was down two to one, and they tied it. And for whatever reason, I'd have to go back and, and, and read, you know, watch the game, watch the podcast, whatever. Tampa's coach was unhappy with something, and the referee went over and gave him a caution and showed him a yellow card. And then he decided to, I guess, try out for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and launch, kick his water bottle over the outfield wall, and that got him a straight red card because that's an easy straight red card. And by the laws of the game, the referee shall send off the coach for kicking the water bottle. That's There's no two ways about it. That's a bye-bye. So because Tampa's coach decided to show his ass and like both cheeks, showed both ass cheeks right there in the, at the touchline, just hang them out. All this extra added time gets put on and not a one FC is able to get a penalty and score and win the game. And so Tampa had nobody to blame but themselves for that, specifically their uh, interim coach because their regular coach was having visa issues, if I'm not mistaken, for that game. And that 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 stopped. That didn't just stop the bleeding. That that strapped it up, bandaged it, stopped the bleeding, strapped it up, discharged from the hospital. And I don't want to see closed the season very very well. Those last several games. I mean, that was kind of fun. I mean, to have a playoff spot locked up, but still have something to play for. 
because you wanted that home playoff game. It was you and Louisville, four or five, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the day, I don't want to see got the home playoff game. Their second straight season hosting a home playoff game and the third straight playoff appearance and three seasons, five seasons, three playoff appearances. So we're batting over 500 on making the playoffs, which, you know, middle of 2021, I didn't think was going to be possible. Uh, I just wondered this was going to be one of those teams that was just eternally doomed to be terrible. And they've turned it around. They turned it around in 21. They were good all of 22. They were streaky in 23, but they found a way to get it done. They top four in the Eastern conference. That's nothing to turn your nose up at. And that is something that that is a, that is an accomplishment. Um, So I'm hard on them, but when they do well, I'm, you know, when you do bad, I say mean things. When you do good, I say nice things. It's, it's, not hard to understand. And they did good, so I'm saying nice things. Then, you know, you had an absolutely gut-wrenching, soul-sucking, dagger, rip-your-heart-out playoff loss to Louisville. Rivalry game. So that sucks. You go up 1-0 in the first minute. Wild. But you knew... Louisville's been in the Eastern Conference Finals every single year of their existence. Coming into this year, it was eight straight years. This year, after this year, it's nine straight years. You knew that them fa- that falling behind 1-0 in the first minute was not going to cause them to hit the panic button the way it would have for other teams. They didn't hit the panic button, and they equalized. And then we got all the way to extra time. Both teams had chances to win in extra times. And Excuse me. Both teams had chances to win in extra time. Neither team took advantage. Everybody came close. I think Dylan Borsak came on as a sub in the last few minutes and immediately created the chance. I think he hit the post maybe twice. Um, Louisville had several other chances that there was one where they were on the break, and I thought that was going to be it, and I don't want to see got back and found a way to keep it out. And then it went to penalties. And I don't like the line of thinking that says penalties is just a crapshoot. Teams that think that way are usually the ones that lose. When Tim Mulqueen was the manager for 901 FC, there was a stretch in 2020 where they had like three different players miss a total of four consecutive, like four straight penalties. Like in however many games they played, they were awarded penalties and they missed at however long of a stretch, they missed like three or four of them. And that, that was one of the ones I asked him about it in the post game. And I was like, do you guys need to just like practice this more? Because and he's like, no, nah, there's, there's no sense in practicing penalties. You either make it or you don't. I was like, oh, that has me worried. I don't know what Stephen Glass's philosophy is on that. But I, my gut, based on what I watched by the way the penalty shootout proceeded against Louisville City, I would say he falls into the camp of you got to practice these. Because though, like all the players that took penalties, I would say were players that should be taking penalties. There wasn't any one of the five guys that went up there where I was like, "Well, what is this dude doing here?" No, all, like they all got up there, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." And they all seemed to be pretty well placed penalties. Um, and then you just got unlucky on the last one, and that's there is an element of luck, and it's like playing poker. Okay, th- th- there's there's luck involved. Poker players will, will tell you there's no such thing as bad luck. It's just a bad beat. Um, there's there's luck involved, but there's also a skill to it, and it's, it can be an art. There's a reason that at the World Cup, Germany has never lost a penalty shootout. Now, they lost in the Olympics, uh, the gold medal game at Rio in 2016. They lost a penalty shootout, and there's a reason that England always loses their penalty shootouts because for the longest time they said, eh, There's no point in practicing. And then Gareth Southgate becomes the manager, a man who missed a penalty in a shootout at Euro 96, and England wins their first ever penalty shootout against Colombia, the World Cup, first ever World Cup penalty shootout against Colombia in 2018 in Russia. American Mark Geiger had the whistle on that game. And he said, yeah, we practice them because you have to practice them. Um, But I... You know, Aiden McFadden just got unlucky. I guarantee you no one feels worse about missing that penalty than he does. Um, But you just got – you took one of the consistently best teams in the league all the way to the fifth and final penalty kick, 
and there's there's no shame. It sucked. It hurt. It hurt me. It hurt the players. It hurt the coaches. It hurt the organization. It hurt the fans. But there's no shame in the way they lost that game. Um, they had a good year. You hosted a home playoff game. What really hurt about it, though, is something they didn't have any control over, is you figured you were going to win that game when you were going to have to go on the road to Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh lost to Detroit. Or Tampa. No, it was Detroit. Because had you won that game, you were going to play Detroit at home. And boys, let me tell you what. I was jacked. I was in the press box going, oh my god, Detroit's coming here. I hate these guys. They're bad people. Oh, hold on. Hang on one second. I got it sitting over here somewhere. Here we go. You didn't think it was going to make an appearance tonight, but it did. Detroit sucks. I wish bad things upon them. They're bad people. Um, so I was jacked. I'm thinking, oh my God, we get to host, we get, Hey, we get to host another home playoff game. Yes. Detroit's coming to town. We've never lost to them. The, like the, the road to the Eastern conference finals was, was there, but the road was there for Louisville too. And that's a fourth and fifth in the standings. I mean, technically you didn't lose to Louisville at all last year. Got a draw at home. You beat them at their place and then went to penalties in the playoffs. Um, but all in all, overall, here's what I would say. I would the grade that I would give 901 FC's season in 2023, I'd give it a B plus. I would give it a B plus. Um, not quite, you know, it was it was a decent season. It, it could have been better. There's one or two games that I think they would want back, but it could have been a lot worse too. It's, it started to feel like it was going to be that way. They righted the ship. They got smooth sailing. They hit rough water and started to... And then they righted the ship again. That's three straight playoffs now. After never, never made it before. Um, that's nothing to turn your nose up at. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's nothing to shy away from. Three straight playoff, playoff appearances for a team only in their fifth season. That's impressive. Um, plus you had an Open Cup run which is always nice. Not just an Open Cup run, but one where you went on the road and beat an MLS team. Um, unfortunately, one thing that prevented this season from being an A is the attendance was way down. And I wrote a very extensive piece for Bluff City Media. You can go to the Bluff City Media website, click on 901 Soccer and find that. Or it's my pinned tweet. So if you find me on Twitter at LDoc93, it's my pinned tweet. You can read it. Although my gut tells me if you're watching this, you probably already have read it, and you might have even contributed to it. Um, so attendance being way down, plus a couple of games that you wanted back, is what prevents, in my opinion, this from being an A season, A minus, A, A plus. Not an A plus because you didn't win a title, uh, but like an A minus was certainly, had you beaten Louisville or had attendance been a little bit better, I think it would have been an A minus season. But B plus, again, no, that's that's not just scraping by by the skin of your teeth. That is that's a solid season to hold your head up about, in my opinion. Um, they've made some off season moves. Um, this is the 2023 recap, not the 2024 preview. So we will discuss those at a later date, probably sometime in February. Um, I like what I'll say. You can scroll to the 901 Soccer Podcast Twitter feed. Go back a couple of days. So far, based on some of these moves, including uh, some, somebody new in the front office, a, return, a key returning player, um, I think so far, plus the timing of it, they've done a lot of good work in December instead of waiting until February. Um, I think this off this off season that we're in currently has been the best off season in 901 FC's history. Not necessarily a high bar to clear, but as the old proverb says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So, overall, 2023 campaign, uh, good hire, good hire getting Stephen Glass. Um, you won the Tulsa trade for Goodrum and DaCosta. Nice Open Cup run, long unbeaten run, bad July, nice strong finish to the season, third straight playoff appearance, and unfortunate loss to Louisville. So that's 901 FC. So now we're going to move just real quick here. The Memphis Americans in the NISL down here in South Haven at the Lander Center. 
Uh, moving into 2023, they was their second season. Uh, the NISL being one of those very rare leagues where each organization has a men's team and women's team, and each game is a double. Each game night is a double header, so you get two tick, you know, two games for the price of one. Which I tried to explain to people. So a lot, a lot. There were a lot of people that I know that are nine hundred one FC fans that just did not want to come to Americans games either because it was too long of a drive to South Haven, uh, which I found amusing considering that I live in South Haven and made it to 16 of the 18 901 FC home games at AutoZone Park, uh, plus one on the road. Um, but also, a lot of people balked at the ticket prices, which I found strange because the ticket prices weren't, they weren't charging you $300 to get in the door. This is not, um, you know, this is not a Grizzlies game. Um, it was like $25. And people said, oh, I don't want to pay $25 to watch indoor soccer. And that's, not an unfair, that's not unsound logic, um, but you were getting to, it was two games. I think, I don't think there were a lot of people, a lot, I think a lot of the people that wanted to go but were discouraged by the ticket price were unaware that it was two games for the price of one, and I would try to explain that to people. Um, in the end, it was all for naught because the Americans are now on hiatus, which yours truly for Bluff City Media broke that story. Um, we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, so entering 2023, following the 2022 season, the Americans women's team was the reigning champs. The men's team was the reigning runner-ups. The most noteworthy thing that happened, and this might be a bookmarked tweet from the 901 Soccer Podcast, as I was sent video, um, they hosted Tampa in one of those Friday, Saturday, or it might have been Saturday, Sunday doubleheaders like the old River Kings games used to be. And the coach for Tampa is former Buccaneers Super Bowl winning kicker, Martin Gramatica. Um, you want to talk about showing your ass. This dude showed his ass, both cheeks, and took a dump on your logo at midfield, proverbially. He didn't actually do that, nor did they have a logo at midfield. Um, it, it, I mean, the, the league itself, the NSIL, the NISL, the league is a joke. Okay, I mean, it, it's the, there's a number of other unflattering things that you could call it, but those might have legal ramifications. So I'm not necessarily comfortable going all that far. If we're off the record and I'm just talking to you, you probably know the word that I've used, or words, or phrases, or descriptions that I've used to describe the NISL. Um, I'm not gonna do it just right here. Um, but the league is a joke. I mean, it, it's a joke, but. The referee, most of the referees I know and have worked with, okay, one of the referees in this particular game against Tampa is a retired FIFA badge, okay? That's, that's, you can't get any higher on the referee chain than a FIFA badge. That means, like, you're eligible to referee at the World Cup, okay? Um, so, he's <laughs> been retired for, for a number of years now and is helping out the assigner who's in charge of these games and doing these and has decided that he is tired of being called every name in the book by Martin Gramatica. Red card, go away. Martin Gramatica leaves the, the bench area and instead of going towards the tunnel to leave like he's been instructed to, walks to midfield to try to fight the referee and has to be held back by three of his players and escorted off the field by his players. The halftime horn sounds... He comes back out, okay? Comes back out of the locker room, onto the field to yell at the referees some more, and once again has to be restrained and escorted by his players. Um, it gets better. The second half starts. He is supposed to be in the locker room. Yes, right? No, he comes, he's on the glass, he's banging on the glass like he's a hockey fan, like it's a River King. I didn't know the River Kings were back. And he's banging on the glass, yelling at the referee some more. The DeSoto County Sheriff's had to escort him back to the locker room. I've seen players and coaches in various sports and various leagues at different levels in this country and in other countries around the world. I've seen, I've seen people show their ass, but I've never seen anything like that. That was incredible. That is both cheeks taking a dump on your logo at midfield. 
is what Martin Gramatica did there. And the players feed off of that. That's something as a referee, you had like, like the players pick up on that. They feed on that. That's not to say that Memphis Americans player coach Corey Adamson didn't have a hand in all of this. Um, you you want you want to talk about a uh, a wind up merchant? That's Corey Adamson. And so the game was over. The Americans win resoundingly, and the play. They, there's a little bit of a dust up, a little bit of a pushing and shoving and jawing and talking and hooting and hollering, and then everybody gets back in the locker rooms and a brawl breaks out. Haymakers, people running out of the locker room with no shorts on. Just it's you can find the video. And um, Martin Gramatica didn't even was allowed to coach the next day. Um, typically, when you get your ass tossed out of a game, you don't get to coach the next day. But you know, like I said, the NISL is a joke, uh, so he got to coach the next day. And just uh, that's the only noteworthy thing really that happened for the Americans this year because. As Bluff City Media, myself, in my capacity with Bluff City Media, broke the story. Two days before the playoffs, the NISL canceled the playoffs. Why would they do that? Me thinks that nobody had bought tickets. So you were going to lose your ass hosting a day-long playoff tournament at UCF's basketball arena in Orlando. And you just decided, nah, season's over. After a careful, what, what, uh, I'd have to go back and read the article, but they put out some bullshit statement about... Uh, careful consideration and consultation with event staff and the players and the coaches and all the players got on Facebook and Twitter and were like, yeah, they didn't, they, they, they told us not to say anything. Um, we're not happy about this. Like I said, the league's a joke. Um, but hey, it was soccer in Memphis and I was more than happy to cover it for you. Um, and then the news came out, broken by yours truly, that the Americans were going on hiatus, uh, which... You know, have you ever seen a successful, well-attended, on-and-off-the-field team uh, go on hiatus? And when the lower team, like if you, if you, the Mississippi River Kings are still on hiatus. They went on hiatus in 2018. It is now 2023, or perhaps you might be watching this in 2024. So that's that's a nice nice long time. I would not expect the Americans back any time before. They're done. They're done. You can put a bow on it. You can call it whatever you want, but your league is a joke, and I hate it for the players because I know some of them. And but the league, the, the the league, every year the league adds two teams and one folds. There's a lot of um, legal terms to describe that, and I will let you, the viewer, listener, draw your own conclusions. Um, there's, uh, there's an old, well, I don't know if the old saying fits, so I'm, I'm not going to say it. But, you know, you got four teams, and then you're down to three. Then you add two, so you're at five. Then you lose one, and you add two more. Uh, that There's uh, there's, there's very, uh, in a, there's an old Italian name to describe what that is. Um, and and, and I, I, will, I, I will leave it at that. Um, so that's it for the Americans. Move on to happier things, and somebody that you know isn't going to go on hiatus. Uh, the University of Memphis women's soccer team. Um, great year. Great year for the U of M women's soccer team. 20 wins, two losses. <laughs> it, 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 could not, it could not have gotten much better. It, there, there's a very narrow way where it could have. But other than, I mean, 20 and 2. What are you going to do, like? 22. Um, sixth straight NCAA tournament appearance. That's also their seventh in the last eight seasons. They won their third straight conference title. They did get screwed in the seeding in the NCAA tournament, which was just egregious. And you can go back. That's the most recent episode of the 901 Soccer Podcast, but you can go check that out. To go, what are they? were 18-1. and one. They won the division they won the conference regular season. They won the conference tournament. They beat four Power Five teams. The only loss was by a single goal on the road at the reigning at a reigning Final Four co- Women's College Cup team on a sketchy penalty call. To be a six seed was outrageous. Absolutely screwed in the seeding. Outrageous. So you're telling me that the team ranked like. 
eighth in the country. You're telling me a top 10 team is not one of the top 25 teams in the country is essentially what that says. That is asinine. And that was outrageous. Now, I say all of that. They still got the host, LSU, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Over 2,000 people showed up. They beat them. They were up 2-0 after like a minute. That was that was just wild. I missed both goals. Then, in the second round, they had to play the three-seeded Notre Dame. And they beat them. So by that point, the seeding didn't end up mattering. The fact that they got screwed in the seeding didn't end up mattering because either way, if they had been a higher seed, they if even if they had been the three seed, which is what... Uh, Brooks Monaghan had said on several occasions that's what they expected. They expected to get a three seed. Well, they beat the three seed. So then you were either way, you were going to play the two seed, Arkansas, in Fayetteville in the Sweet 16. It's their second straight Sweet 16 appearance, and the road to an Elite Eight was wide open because much the same way that the Pittsburgh Riverhounds had been upset opening up a potential path for not a 1FC, so the Pittsburgh Panthers upset Arkansas in Fayetteville to open up a path for the U of M. Unfortunately, um, that was just one of those times where you see it in basketball a lot in the NCAA tournament where just a random ass team gets really hot for no reason at all. And nobody can beat them. That was Pitt in this women's NCAA tournament. Um, They ended up running. And then as inevitably happens, you run into the buzzsaw of the real team with the real talent and the real coaching and that's what happened to Pitt. Of course, that's not to that's not to disparage the players or the coaches of Pitt. In fact, Pitt's coach, I believe, is a guy named Randy Waldrum, who has coached several women's international soccer teams. So he knows what he's doing. Um, but that's a game that, I mean, that that was a run that was not supposed to happen. Um, and for a brief moment, Memphis had visions of going to the Elite Eight. They were going to end up having to play Florida State in Tallahassee. That was going to be a tough, tough. Tough test. Florida State's won three or four national championships in the last 10 years. I mean, they're one of the premier powers of women's college soccer. So that was going to be a tough test for Memphis to go on the road and beat Florida State. Um, You would rather have lost to Florida State in the Elite Eight than Pitt in the Sweet 16. But still, uh, back-to-back Sweet 16 appearances for the Memphis women's soccer team, all in all, A very, very, very good year. Just about every single player on the team won some sort of Player of the Year award uh, conference. You know, uh, Maya Jones, Grace Storty, Momo Nakao. Like, I can go on. Uh, And I I would really would just need to read the roster is what I would have to do. Because all the awards that they were up for, they won them. Brooks Monaghan won Coach of the Year. Like, all all the will check, 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 check. Because they're awesome. And they have been awesome for a very long time. And we certainly hope that they can continue to be awesome. And that leaves us with the U of M men's team. Now, the U of M men's team is not quite the success story that the U of M women's team is in soccer. Um, but they are on the up and up. They are, they are trending in the right direction, as they say. This is a program that, quite frankly, has stunk for years. Prior to Richard Mulrooney's arrival in 2014, they had made the, made the NCAA tournament twice. Um, so you could say that he had, he had his work cut out for him. Now he's an MLS veteran, former U S national team player, U of M alum. So if anybody could do it, it would be him. And he has, and it took him a minute, but last year they made their first ever NCAA tournament appearance under him. Let me, it wasn't their first ever NCAA tournament appearance. It was their first appearance with coach Mulrooney and they lost in overtime to St. Louis, I believe. But this year, they made history. A, well, first off, they had a great year. They finished 11-6-2. That's 11 wins, 6 losses, 2 draws. Excuse me. They had an absolutely wild, bonkers conference tournament game against USF at home. I mean, you want to talk about, you can go read the recap over at Bluff City Media that I wrote. They were dead. They were done. They were dead in the water. You're down 2-1. to one. You're chasing a goal, and for some reason, you can't pass the ball to your team. You keep sending it out of bounds. You keep sending it to USF. USF was getting more chances than Memphis, and they were bunkered in. And it was wild. I was like, these guys are done. This is going to hurt their tournament chances. And then out of nowhere, boom, counterattack, goal, own goal. Not two minutes later, corner kick, boom, goal. 
Ball game. Memphis wins. Wild. Um, and that is the, the the juxtaposition. You see it all the time, especially like during Champions Leagues or World Cup knockout rounds. Or the uh, it's a cruel, cruel game. But you have the the high of the team that won and just the soul crushing devastation of the team that lost. And that was on full display in that Memphis men's game against USF in the conference tournament. Um, and then by virtue of that, that pretty much locked up their spot in the NCAA tournament. So they made history. They made the NCAA tournament for a second consecutive year. That's the first time that's ever happened for the U of M men's program. The additional history is they got to host an NCAA tournament game. It's only their first fourth ever appearance, and they got to host a tournament game. They got over a 1,000 people out there uh, just a few days after the women's team hosted LSU. They hosted SIU Edwardsville, who was unbeaten. They had won like 18 games and had three draws, I think. And they went up 2-0, conceded, and held on for dear life, and got a win. Their first ever NCAA tournament win. Then they went on the road and were duly beaten soundly by North Carolina. North Carolina, not quite the level of Florida State women, but still a consistent power in men's college soccer. Um, So that was their year. Great year for, really, I mean, this was a very fun year to be a soccer fan in Memphis, to have... 9-1 9-1 FC make their third straight playoff appearance and go on a nice little run in the Open Cup. You had the Americans. The, the playoffs got canceled, but the Americans women's team, number one team in the league. Americans men's team, I believe, was the number two team in the league. Um, and then when they canceled, when the NISL canceled the playoffs, they just said, you're the champs, and then whoever was in first on the men's side was the champs as well. Then you had the Memphis women's team go to the Sweet 16 for the second straight year after winning their – third straight conference title. And then you had the Memphis men's team make their second straight and secretly tournament for the first time ever and win a game for the first time ever. So it was a very, very good year if you are a soccer fan in Memphis. And I think that is going to do it here tonight. Um, Thanks, everybody, for listening in. I do want to say that um, you are all owed additional thanks from me personally as – This year, the 901 Soccer Podcast saw its second best year in the five years that I've been doing this show. Um, I do think a a, a part of that uh, is due to the move here to Buff City Media, which I'm so very grateful for. Um, But viewership, listenership, whatever you want to call it, the audience grew 48% from 2022 to 2023. So thank you, everybody, so much for listening and liking, and subscribing, and following, and retweeting, and sharing, and commenting, and all the good stuff that the YouTube people like to tell you you need to do. Um, I appreciate those of you that did that, and those of you that didn't, that's okay. You have plenty more opportunities to do so, and I would encourage you to do just that. So thank you to everybody. We got a lot more, a lot in store for 2024. The 901 to see home schedule is out. Um, I'm sure once we get into August, we will get into the U of M men's and women's teams. And soccer, these next five years in this country are going to be incredible. You have the Copa America here in 2024. You have the Club World Cup in 2025. You have the World Cup in 2026. U.S. soccer is bidding to host the Women's World Cup in 2027. And then the Olympics are in L.A. in 2028. So if soccer hasn't made it by 2030, it's cause to wonder if it ever will. Um, But I don't think any of those games are going to be played here in Memphis. But 901 FC games and U of M games are going to be. That I know. So everybody should get out and support 901 FC, support the U of M men's and women's teams. If the Americans were around, I'd I'd tell you to get out and support them too, but they're on hiatus. Have you ever seen a successful minor league franchise uh, go on hiatus? And then the ones that have, have you ever seen them come back? No, you have not. Um, But again, thank you everybody so much for listening along the way, for sharing and all that good stuff. Stay tuned for 2024. I do want to say real quick, if you are a potential sponsor, if you're somebody that is, you've got money to burn, uh, feel free to reach out to me. If you feel to reach out to the folks at Bluff City Media, 
and we will see if you have goods or services that you are interested in advertising, we'd be more than happy to do that for you. So feel free to reach out. I'm on Twitter at LDoc93, 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter at 901 Soccer Pod, Bluff City Media on Twitter at Bluff City underscore media, on Facebook, 901 Soccer, and Bluff City Media. Thank you, everybody, for so much. Thank you, everybody, so much for a great 2023. Let's hope that 2024 is even better.